Well, well done, everybody. I expected to turn around and find nobody here. So congratulations on your tenacity. And uh, remember the take-home messages. My take-home message is that pretty well everything we've heard about today, and it was touched on earlier by Cully, is that it affects the family. I mean, imagine being married to somebody who's in atrial fibrillation, worried, sick, that they're going to drop dead, or somebody with pelvic pain or ED. Uh, I was interested in the grumpy German men in the graph we saw earlier. How does that affect their kids? These guys are just fed up, they're grumpy, they're miserable, they're not a lot of fun to be at home with. So my take-home message is think about the family, because what goes on in our office isn't necessarily what goes on at home. And one of the issues that really does affect the family is addictions. We don't seem to be on the screen there. We're on end of thank you. Yeah. So what do we mean by addictions? Well, I'm addicted to chocolate. I'm addicted to golf, to, to sailing. I'm addicted to thrill-seeking. Um, we use operational definitions when we're all being professional and, and trying to get it right. We use the ICD-10, we use the dsm 4 I won't go through what they actually refer to, but they're basically, you've got to have five of the following 12 features in order to be diagnosed as alcohol-dependent kind of stuff. I like the definition from a, it's not a self-help group, it's a mutual help group called Narcotics Anonymous. Their definition of addiction is an addict is a man or woman whose life is controlled by drugs. It's the most important thing in their life. The substance or the activity becomes more important than their health, their socioeconomic function and most things in their life. It starts to become important and takes over. And let's just zip through the substances that people use. Uh, stimulants, these are drugs that wake us up, they depress the appetite, and they elevate the mood. And they're nicotine, caffeine, cocaine, amphetamines, things like that, stimulants. Sedatives, most common sedative drug in the world, nicotine. High doses of nicotine are a sedative, low doses are a stimulant. The most common, common sedative is, of course, alcohol. And Opioids, we've talked a bit about, but there's loads. These are basically derivatives from the opium poppy. They can be either synthetic or directly derived, and they are analgesics. And there's actually a huge problem now with uh, opioids that are, or prescription medications that are available on the internet. Uh, Barack Obama's recently put out a whole um, strategy to deal, to try and deal with, with the epidemic or the, the uh, the tsunami, if you like, of prescription medications that are flying around America, and the same thing is starting to happen here. I've got somebody taking Zolpidem, 160 tablets a day. So, you know, it's a lot, and, and these are coming in on the internet. So there's lots of different sort of things we can get addicted to. Uh, these are behaviors or process addictions. Uh, how many of us are, are addicted to work? You know, how many of us have had a reasonable holiday this year? There's things like gambling, there's sexual acting out or, or compulsive sexual behavior, which can really mess up people's lives. People can compulsively get into food. Uh, they can get into exercise. People take in the gym for four hours a day, often with an eating disorder of some sort. Uh, we can compulsively go shopping, spending. I know a rock star who goes shopping, gets Armani suits made for him in Rome, never wears them and he feels bad about himself for spending money on stuff he doesn't really want. Um, and I'm sure that people uh, have come across people who do excessive shopping, which isn't just normal retail therapy, it's excessive spending money they can't afford and they don't feel good about themselves afterwards. Thrill-seeking behavior, there's, we've touched on it, um, Roger's slide of the guy skiing down the slope in the James Bond movie. Um, men and thrill-seeking and risk-taking, something we haven't had a huge amount on today, but it's definitely there. And it's also, I don't know who won the book, but there's, a good chap there's some good chapters on men's behavior in Roger's book uh, on men's health, which of course contains a fabulous chapter on alcohol by yours truly. Um, <laughs> these are all behaviors and substances and things that give us instant gratification. They make us feel good now. I've got to have that cream done. <laughs> I'm going to have that drug, I'm going to go out and go shopping. These are things that give us instant gratification, and that's absolutely fine as long as it doesn't become a problem. When it starts to become a problem and when it starts to take over people's lives, then it can reasonably be referred to as an addiction. So what are the most important global addiction problems? Well, tobacco and alcohol. I'm not going to say much about tobacco, it's a huge subject, but one of the most interesting things I've heard today was Procar say that the incidence or prevalence of bladder cancer in a few years' time, we'll look back and we'll say, well, the big thing that changed all that was 
stopping, pe stopping people smoking. You know, that for me, I, I hadn't really appreciated that uh, until Prokar eloquently said so earlier on. So we're going to talk a bit about alcohol because it's a good framework around which to talk about other addictions. And the way we drink, the way we kind of take our drugs, the way we take our substances, we, we try it out as we're growing up. We experiment with alcohol depending on our background, our parents, our socioeconomic, cultural situation. So if we're lads in Newcastle, we'll drink real ale out of straight glasses or brown ale out of straight glasses. If we're in the, the tennis club in Belgravia, we'll be drinking champagne. We'll try it out. And most of us in this, in, around the world actually, but particularly in the Western culture, we become recreational drinkers. We, discover what we like, it might be wines, beers, spirits, uh, and we enjoy it. Recreational drinkers can take it or leave it. They don't harm themselves or anybody else. And they, you know, it's part of fun, it's part of normal social life, and it's actually pleasurable, it's good. And we have hazardous and harmful drinkers, which Professor Williams talked about earlier, and we'll go over that a bit again. And then we move into dependent drinkers. And the hallmark of a dependent drinker or an addict is whatever it is they're doing or whatever it is they're taking becomes important to that person. That's the hallmark. There's a lot of people who drink in a recreational manner, and alcohol enhances the quality of life and the sociability of many cultures, many societies. And people who drink two units a day will probably live longer. It doesn't matter what the drink is. It can be wine, beer, spirits. It's ethyl alcohol, has strong antioxidant qualities, and people are likely to live longer. So that's the good news. As has already been shown, something like, in fact, it was more on the earlier slide, 38% of men and probably 16% of women, and there's a hidden group of women. There are loads of women who've got alcohol issues that we don't know about, particularly in other country, countries and cultures where it's illegal for women to drink or they're treated like criminals. 38% um, of men have an alcohol use disorder, and that's quite a big thing. Um, by alcohol use disorder, we're talking about hazardous drinking or harmful drinking or dependent drinking or alcoholism. So hazardous drinking, we've already talked about it, it has the potential to, come, to become harmful and it may cause tissue damage. And it's seen in anyone consuming more than the recommended guidelines and anybody who's a binge drinker who's drinking more than eight units over 24 hours if they're men or six units if they're women. And the recommended limits, I was surprised. I think Roger Williams and I differ slightly. Um, it's tw I understand it to be 28 units a week for men. I, I don't know if, any, if there's been a new recommended guideline, but three to four units a day for men, two to three units a day for women, no units for pregnant women, and a unit is 10 grams of alcohol, eight to 10 grams of alcohol. So that's one measure, one glass, of, small glass of wine, what used to be half a pint of beer, and one measure of spirits is one unit. So you guys can all work it out. And the complications of excessive drinking, and this is not addiction or alcoholism, but I'll just zip through these. Um, they might be direct or indirect, because lots of people smoke, for example, who drink a lot. And the direct consequences include kids behind the bike shed glugging away at a bottle of vodka. They get acute intoxication. One minute they're laughing, the next minute they're sort of drunk, the next minute they're falling asleep. Next minute they can't wake them up. They call the ambulance. By the time the ambulance gets there, they've died of alcohol poisoning. They might aspirate vomit because they lose their reflexes. Various well-known people have done that, Jimi Hendrix being one. People say he died because the ambulance men left him sitting up in the back of the ambulance. And people have accidents and as a direct consequence of drinking alcohol. And then the physical consequences, I'm going to test you all on this just to see if you're awake. Um, loads of gastro disorders, so liver disease, cirrhosis, pancreatitis, ulcers, Mallory Weiss syndrome, musculoskeletal, gout, myopathies endocrine disorders. This is all to do with excessive drinking, by the way. Um, cancers, increased oropharynx, esophageal, liver, possibly breast cancer in women. Don't think we're sure about that. Cardiovascular disorders, a lot of which we've already talked about, strongly correlated with excessive intake of alcohol. Different drugs obviously have their different complications. We're focusing on alcohol, but with, say, cocaine, it's going to be different. Metabolic disorders. Lots of people come in, and the real problem, the real diagnosis, is they're drinking too much. And a lot, a lot of times we forget that. We don't necessarily test for it. We don't give them uh, rating scales in our surgeries to see whether these people are drinking too much. 
and we get disorders of the central peripheral nervous system, convulsions, the girl I was telling you about with the Zolpidem, loads of withdrawals, loads of uh, withdrawal fits. Um, anybody going to tell me what Machia Faba Binyami disease is, please? See if anyone's awake. See if anyone remembers any neurology. I had to look it up. It's to do with disintegration of the corpus callosum. Um, I'm sure you may not recognize it when it comes into the office. Um, and loads of, you know, if somebody who's severely dependent on alcohol, you can see peripheral neuropathies, um, foot drop, the kind of classic things that we learn about as medical students, they're, they're real. Skin conditions, which you don't think about as a complication of alcohol, uh, immune deficiency. So if Peter Amoroso is putting one of his patients to sleep and they've got a whacking great tolerance to alcohol, they, they're drinking a bottle of whiskey a day, he's going to need more of the general anesthetic induction agent, whatever it is he uses these days, to get them to go to sleep. And of course, psychological uh, issues. Alcohol often is the cause of a lot of the symptoms that people present in, to, to psychologists and therapists. And Loads of people with notes that thick come in with a diagnosis of depression. They've been uh, given antidepressants that don't understand what's going on. Will you see them as a psychiatrist? And no one's actually sat down and taken a really thorough alcohol history from them. And it's often difficult to do. It takes me an hour and a half to do it properly. So not everybody's in that luxurious position. But alcohol can be the cause of mood disorders like depression, anxiety states. If you're in alcohol withdrawal, you feel anxious. And sometimes psychotic states, particularly some of the other drugs that are around these days, kids smoking skonk, there's a huge amount of uh, drug-induced psychosis flying around. And what we have to do is keep them drug-free and see if the, if the symptoms continue uh, in order to distinguish whether it's actually a drug-induced state or whether it's a drug-precipitated underlying illness, hopefully not, such as a schizophrenic illness. And of course, personality disorders. Anybody with a drink problem is going to fit into one of the personality disorder frameworks, um, whatever they are. So society as a whole suffers from alcohol-related problems. And if you look at the list, they're all things you've seen before, but things like suicide, murder, etc. And if you think of how the family gets affected by these things, it's pretty, it's pretty staggering. I've had a, a couple whose, whose child committed suicide because they had a massive drug addiction. I mean, that's, you know, how, how horrible can things get? So we lose billions as a result of alcohol dependence, drug use, alcohol excess. And policies are a bit all over the place. The only thing that really sticks out is the availability. The more there is a drug, the more available it is, the more people use it, the more problems you get. And it doesn't really affect the levels of dependence a whole lot. So you get things like prohibition. And a lot of people think that prohibition in the United States was a kind of time of speakeasies in Chicago and illicit booze and moonshine smuggled in by mobsters and stuff. Actually, there were very few alcohol-related problems in the USA during prohibition. It was an unpopular but very successful harm reduction strategy. And it got changed, and now, now everybody has their alcohol-related problems. But if you look at, for example, states where you've got to be a certain age before you can drink a certain quantity of alcohol, or even driving, um, you get <clears throat> the more available the drug is, alcohol, the, the more problems you get. I think Cully will probably agree with, with that thing in the United States, where some states you can drink 3% beer when you're 18, but you can't drink 6% and, and, and that sort of difficulty. In Scandinavian cities, alcohol's not that available because it's so expensive. So if you go to Reykjavik on a Friday, Saturday night, people stay at home and they drink at home, and then about midnight they go out and go to these dance parlors not my thing, but they go, and they drink more. And about 2 o'clock in the morning, they're falling out of these places, getting into taxis. And you get people from all walks of life, all socioeconomic groups, completely drunk in the center of Reykjavik. And I was at a conference staying in a hotel and heard this banging outside my room. And it was an elderly couple who couldn't get into their, into their hotel room. And so they were fumbling about with the key. And so I opened the door for them, shoved them in, shut the door, threw the key inside, and left them to it. But you know, And they didn't look like down-and-out alcoholics to me, they look like doctors, actually. But um, <laughs> that's what... <laughs> so 
hazardous and harmful drinkers, as Roger Williams said, will often respond to a brief intervention. Uh, even a screening test, a mast or a fast test in the surgery, can actually get people to think, whoa, I'm drinking too much here. And if they're not dependent, the chances are they can actually alter their relationship with alcohol. And it's, it's pretty simple to do. It takes 10 minutes, a bit of motivational work um, can, can, can help. And a brief intervention, as we know, can be highly effective. Out of people who are alcohol dependent, this, these are the figures that we know about. 60 to 80 percent around the world are men. Usually comes on insidiously, creeps up on people, you know, if they're having a few drinks at university, lots of people at university, college drink a lot, and then they settle down, get a job, and then by the time they're 40, 45, it's creeping up so that it's, they've started to become dependent. By the way, the easiest thing in the world to diagnose is severe dependence. It's the, everybody knows the person's an alcoholic, everybody you know, knows that they've got a problem. It's the person with the red nose, maybe sitting even on a park bench. But most people with alcohol dependence are at work, they're often professional people, and they're people to whom alcohol has become important. They get a tolerance. Anybody who drinks on a regular basis gets a tolerance. You've got to have all of these features to be diagnosed as dependent. You need withdrawal symptoms. A hangover is a mixture of withdrawal and accumulation of acetaldehyde and dehydration. So the aldehyde gives you the thumping headache. And how do you relieve that withdrawal? How do you relieve the hangover? You have the hair of the dog that bit you and have a couple of drinks to raise the blood level of alcohol. People who are becoming dependent do all this stuff and they start to really get a craving for alcohol or for their drug of choice. They get a compulsion, I'm going to have a drink, nothing's going to stop me. And one of the most sensitive hallmarks is if they're abstinent for whatever reason, they're in prison or it's Lent or Ramadan or whatever, when and if they start drinking again, they go back into dependent drinking with a tolerance and withdrawal and relief drinking very rapidly. So you'll get someone who's been in jail, used to drink 20 pints of Guinness, they'll come out after six months, have a couple of pints of Guinness because they've lost their tolerance, but within a week they're right back up to 20 pints of Guinness and the shakes and relief drinking. And reinstatement after abstinence is probably the most sensitive indicator of dependence, and it probably applies to most drugs, certainly the opiates. So the most common is the regular insidious top-up drinker, but we also see people who will be abstinent for six months and then they'll drink three bottles of Jack Daniels a night for a week and just be an absolute nightmare, and they get very ill indeed. Something like 9% of male drinkers in the UK and USA drink in a dependent manner, and that's throughout the spectrum of moderate or severely dependent. That's a big public health problem, folks. 10% of men drink in a dependent manner. It's a big thing. I love this. Alcohol dependence subtracts 4.2 disability-adjusted life years from the person's life. Just to give you some comparison, tobacco is 4.1, AIDS is 6, illicit drug use, that's all the heroin, cocaine, all the stuff that hits the press, is 0.8, and type 1 diabetes is 0.1. So we're talking about a big public health problem here that kills people. Alcohol and a lot of the other things we've heard about today affect the family. And it's kids, it's wives, it's husbands, it's cousins, it's work colleagues. And we know there's a genetic predisposition or a genetic component to alcohol dependence. It's not that clearly worked out, but from Scandinavian twin studies and things, we know that there is a genetic component to people becoming dependent on alcohol. And we also know that families break up as a result of alcoholism, and it can lead to transgenerational problems in our kids and in our grandkids. It's pretty complicated. The bad news after much debate is that people who are dependent, moderately or severely dependent, should probably head for abstinence. You know, controlled drinking doesn't work once you've become moderately to severely dependent. It just doesn't work. People argue about it. They do studies. They follow, the studies are followed up, and they find that the people who are supposed to be controlling their drinking are all jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge or, you know, getting, getting arrested or whatever. It doesn't work, basically. The good news is that actually modern treatments for alcohol and, and for drug addiction are actually powerful and very effective, and you get a whole bunch of people who kind of get a rebirth. They actually start you know, discovering all kinds of other aspects of their lives. And if the family gets treatment as well, then everybody does better. And 
along with many of the diagnoses that we've heard about today, it's usually the family that get the person into treatment, that get the person. You've got to do something about this. We're not going to have another weekend like we had last weekend with you disappearing, going out for a box of matches and not coming back till Thursday. You know, and it's the family who usually get people into treatment as they do with... And, and the family often are more distressed than the person who's actually getting treatment. The family are often in a real mess. They, they think it's their fault. They think they're ashamed, they're angry. Uh, they're often, they often need more kind of help and treatment than does the person who's actually in recovery from their addiction. The best results you get with addiction treatment are with doctors, airline pilots, lawyers, policemen, uh, who are treated properly, usually in residential treatment, and then they're monitored afterwards. And if they're found to have a urine sample that's positive for cocaine or they're drinking again, they lose their licence. You know, they're monitored post-operatively op operatively for maybe three, five years. So the Betty Ford Centre uh, and other places that do good licensed professional programmes run these programmes, they're specialist programmes, and the, the results are amazing. You get something like an 86% success rate in people who complete those programmes. Now, whatever form of medicine you do, 86% is pretty good. Betty Ford Centre are coming to town in about 10 days' time. If you'd like to come along or you want to find out more about it, I've got some flyers here. Do come up afterwards and I'll, I'll let you know where it is. It's in the, in the King's Fund, actually, on the 2nd. And they've got a great programme for, for professionals. It really is worth checking it out. And if you've got doctors who are in difficulty with drugs and alcohol, think about treating them properly rather than just sort of telling them to take anti-abuse or whatever, um, because people do really well and it's worth actually knowing about that. So I won't go on about it, but you know, this is important stuff certainly in my professional life. So alcohol isn't a terrible thing. It enhances the health, pleasure, quality of life in a lot of us, a third of the global population. You don't have to be alcoholic to be an excessive drinker, but a lot of men will die early because of their relationship with alcohol and other drugs. And alcohol use disorders and alcohol dependence are highly treatable. You can treat this stuff. Policies are all over the place. They have, you know, it's illegal in some places, and, and uh, there's all these rules, regulations. I mean, licensing hours have been extended in this country. It's, it's all over the place, and we don't really know um, the epidemiological and clinical research that's necessary to actually make sensible policies. So enjoy a sensible drink. I think there's an Italian wine tasting thing coming up shortly. And enjoy, and um, hope you've had a good day.